I don't know, it's a major. I mean, I spent all last winter, I have a house in Los Angeles, in the Hollywood Hills. And I make the tired joke, you know, arguably between Hollywood and Ravello, Italy, you can say I don't live in America at all. But uh, as America is in my head, and as America is my subject, and wherever I am, there is America. I sometimes think I've limited myself in a way by being so intensely interested in the country and in its politics and in the design of its history, which is what the... And I never called it American Chronicle. That was the publishers. I call them narratives of empire from Burr to Lincoln to 1876 right up to the, the Golden Age. What I'm doing is trying to find a design in our history. I'm trying to find... How deliberate was the acquisition of empire? Was there a plan? Or were there many similar plans that coalesced into this global empire that is causing the world so much trouble and is so expensive for us to maintain? And I think toward the end of Palimpsest, Pal <laughs> I just saw the book Palimpsest and I say the title of the Golden Age, I begin to draw a pattern Italy is a place just to go to to write, and uh, the Hollywood Hills is a place to, when I'm living in America, from which I politic and sometimes do the odd movie. If we were to find you in Ravello writing, where exactly would you be? Well, I'd be in my studio in a villa, which is about 700 meters above the sea, it's on a cliff with a spectacular view of the Gulf of Salerno in front of me and then right across the Gulf is past um, the Greek temples from the 5th century on a clear day. You think you can see them, but I don't think we do see them. And I would be there sitting in a cube room, cube-like room, painted white, writing uh, in longhand on yellow legal sheets. No computer? No computer. How do you revise? <laughs> I have it typed up. I fax it to London, where I have a typist. She faxes it back to me. She's got a floppy disk. And I do another version. I do generally about five or six versions of everything. Sometimes I try to cheat and stop at four, and it's not right. So that is the work process. When do you do your best work? Are you a morning person? Oh, yeah. When I get up, which might not be morning, but uh, I find it not only the closer you are to the dream state that you've been in before awakening, the much readier the imagination is, <clears throat> not to mention memory. With age you begin to start to forget names and numbers and so on. I find that if I've got a problem and I can't think of something, and if I just put it on hold in the morning, it comes to me. I have the name that I was looking for, or the book that I'm trying to find. Graham Greene said something, the same thing. He used to have a house on Anna Capri. Capri is just up the coast from us. And uh, he said that uh, any problem he had was always solved the next morning when he got out. I regarded Graham as a wonderful man and uh, sometimes a good writer, but uh, what we call an easy settler in the movie business. That means somebody who does a first draft. And, okay, that's it. It's perfect. Huntsville, Alabama. You're on for Gore Vidal. Mr. Vidal, it's it's an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Sir, can, um, I, can I stop you for a second? You're having a little bit of feedback because your television's up too high, and that's what's causing the problem for you. Turn it down and then go ahead with your question. I, always hope I know you went to one away. of the most exclusive prep schools in the U.S., but to what do you attribute your brilliance? I'd like some pointers on how you could write a book as brilliant as The Judgment of Paris. Well, it certainly had nothing to do with any school I ever went to. I went to St. Albans here and Exeter up in New Hampshire. I have never been so bored in my life. I had one or two 
good teachers at both places. But the courses, I mean, the boredom that they inflicted, this is the period where you had to learn by rote, memorize, memorize. I remember innocently when I got to Exeter, I said, so when are we going to get to the Roman Empire? We don't get to the Roman Empire. You'll be translating Julius Caesar. That's all we do. They taught nothing of interest to me. And my marks were very bad. And I barely passed what they call then the college board exams. But instead, at 17, I enlisted in the army. I never went back to school. I was supposed to go to Harvard. I came back. To, I did go to Harvard after my first book came out to lecture. And there in the audience were at least ten boys that I had been to Exeter, been with at Exeter, who were very old undergraduates, having just come out of the war, veterans. And that was a triumphal moment, you know, that I had gone my own way, not gone to university. If I am in any way brilliant, or if I am in any way learned, is perhaps a better word, I was in the habit of reading all my life with a man who was part of history and a historian as well. And I was immersed in uh, literature and in history. And I never stopped reading. And I'm always trying to find out things. I wanted to know everything when I was a kid. I remember I used to make charts. The history of the world, and they, they now do them, but they didn't exist then, in which in the first century you'd find out what they were doing in Egypt, what they were doing in China, what the doing in uh, North America. Comparative history. And I just thought that up myself. I'd make these enormous charts and then fill in the various centuries. I think, well, I am what they call an autodidact. Uh, I taught myself. And as somebody said to me uh, in Oregon recently, when I was after a speech, autodidacts have gone to the wrong school, said this guy from Harvard. I said, well, let others be the judge. Next is the call from Seattle. Hi. Um, I, in, uh, in 1971, you wrote an article that was a cover story for Esquire magazine, and, and it supported Ralph Nader for president. Right. And I was wondering if you were a supporter of his current campaign. Uh, no. Tim Robbins and Susan Sarandon are great friends of mine, and we just had dinner together. They're supporting Nader, and many of my friends are. Obviously, the idea is that he is a virtuous figure and is not, not going to be elected, but he might, through his candidacy this year, set up a Green Party, which would be useful in future years. Well, that's the third party route. I've done that and uh, with Dr. Spock, the People's Party, in 1968-70. I don't see any future in that. We've, oh, we've got one political party, which is corporate America's possession, and it has two right wings, Democratic Party, Democratic wing, Republican wing. I'm really interested in, not in a third party, but in getting us a second party as they got back in 1856 when uh, all the splits started and the Republican Party was invented and did a great job for the United States. So I'm, I'm for that really rather than uh, a third, fourth, fifth Buchanan party or this party, a Nader party. And then when asked the question by the press, I said, well, at the end of the day, I think Gore is thicker than Nader. When you mention your current thinking uh, or that America is essentially corporate America, you mentioned earlier that this is a theme that runs throughout the series. In fact, has it always been a situation of the powerful interests versus the people? Yes. And it is really the essential conflict in American life. And it's the real party system, no matter what the official parties are. There is the line of Jefferson and there is the line of Hamilton. Hamilton was for big industry, banking, national bank, world trade, forcing ourselves upon other people if necessary. Jefferson was the mind your own business, a more agricultural life, more bucolic, and most Americans are Jeffersonians. 
uh, only the bankers, at least at the time of World War I, World War II, were interventionist. Americans do not want to go abroad to be killed in other countries, sometimes countries they've never heard of before. You asked me earlier about my, my politics. Well, it is anti-imperialist. And uh, certainly I'm not anti-banking. That would be you know, flat earth politics. We must have that, but it must be kept in balance. And our problem is that they, uh, they are the masters. And they have bought the politicians. Just look at this year. It's going to be a billion dollars, half a billion anyway, paid on this election. An election that nobody's going to bother with if they can help it because they're not interested. The candidates, whether they are intelligent, like my cousin Albert, or if they are somewhat disturbed or disturbing, like his opponent, uh, basically don't differ much and have nothing to say because the people who give them the money to run don't want them to address real issues. What is a real issue? There's only one thing to talk about in the year 2000. And that is, for 50 years, we have been a militarized economy, a garrison state. We've spent over $7 trillion since 1949 on war. That is the, th the theme of my American Chronicle, as it is called. Uh, how the people, on the one hand, are left behind and are exploited in the early days by Eastern banks. Now, it's of course, it's, it's the great corporations that own the country by the politicians. The corruption is total. Now, when corruption is systemic, you can't say, well, Bush is, is, is corrupt, or Gore is corrupt, or this one or that one. The whole system is corrupt, the whole means of raising money. Well, this starting out with Burr, you see the fight, my first novel in that series, you see the fight going on between Burr and Jefferson on these very issues, and the fight, particularly Hamilton. And these two men, Hamilton and Jefferson, defined American life. Jefferson is with the people. The Hamilton is with the Aristos, or the great business magnates. And this is a struggle, except the Hamiltonians have won. Now, what you should talk about is why 51% of our budget, 1999, went for war, went to the Pentagon. They're now demanding $30 billion a year, more over the next decade. Now we're getting away from books, I'm going to give a political speech. You told me before the program started that you just spent some time calculating how much money this country has allocated to weaponry. Yes, sir. Over what period and what's the number? I just gave it to you. I, just this instant you yeah. gave it to me? I apologize. Say it again. $7.1 trillion has gone for war since 1949. Okay. And we have had no enemy except the ones we selected. As far as I know, the Viet Cong never attacked us. We attacked them in the interests of corporate America. There were a lot of ties between great corporations and South Vietnam. We interfered in their civil war and in their affairs, and we have suffered greatly. Same thing with Korea. It was 49 was when the big build-up started. Harry Truman put in peacetime drafting, enormous amount of money for the military, and uh, it, was so, it was all quite deliberate. He used uh, the fact that Greece and Turkey, this is about 1950, might fall to the Russian bear because England had been protecting Greece and England was broke. We must take their place. And he, he and Dean Acheson, who was, this is all in the golden age, so those interested in the subject may turn to that. But they got together and decided to make a real issue that the Russians were coming, the Russians were coming. Communism was a great danger to the United States. Well, communism was a great danger to the Russians and to the people, their satellite states. They were no danger to us. But officially, the good reason for the build-up was that Truman and Atchison were afraid we'd fall back into the Depression. We didn't get out of the Depression until 1940 when we started to arm to go to war against Hitler and uh, Japan struck at us. That ended the Depression. Now they're beginning to see dicey times coming. They love General Motors. They said, what's good for General Motors is good for the country, said the chairman of the board. And that meant war. 
It's been nothing but war ever since. One historian put it very nicely in one phrase, our policy is perpetual war for perpetual peace. And that is insanity. That is why we have the worst public educational system uh, in the first world. That's why we have no health care for the people. The people get nothing back for their tax money. This is a populist line that you're hearing from me, and that is the theme of many of my books. We get nothing back except all this armament. And lately, if you've been reading the papers, the chiefs of, of the various services are demanding more and more money because it's all deteriorating, and there is no enemy. We create enemies. We blow up an asteroid.